conversation. We're, we're asking the intercession of our ladies tonight as we gather for this town hall meeting. So, just really quickly, we're going to talk about a vision for St. Mary Parish, what we do and how we act. I want you to understand two things, behind, or actually, I want you to understand one specific reason why we're headed in this direction. First of all, um, in September, I was with the parish staff, and we were uh, we were engaged in a retreat, and uh, and the the speaker of this retreat, Father John Ricardo, said that successful organizations are able to answer two specific questions. The first question is, what do we do? And then the second question is, how do we act? The third, there's actually a third question. The third question is, how do we know that we're successful? But I'm not ready to go there yet. I'm gonna, I'm, this parish vision is ultimately about what we do and how we act. So it all starts with this. And I talked about this in the bulletin article. I've talked about this in the, uh, in the uh, series of uh, videos that I've shared with you. We want to return. We want to renew our commitment to what is sacred to whom we owe reverence and devotion and worship. And that is to our Lord. We want to sensitize, resensitize ourselves to the presence of God in our midst. And I'll tell you why I am going here. Last May, I was in, uh, I was in the church and I was preparing for the baccalaureate mass. And people started to come into church in preparation for the baccalaureate mass. And they got there 45 minutes early. And then, uh, and then more and more people came. And by the time it was about 10 to 6, the church was just exploding with conversation, exploding with noise. It was complete chaos. There was a man who approached me and said, Father, you know, we're getting ready for a mass. Can we, can we, can you quiet him down? And I said, I don't know that I can do that. I think we've kind of moved past that point. So finally at six o'clock, you know, we settled him down for mass and we started to move on. But it was at that moment, I really began to wonder myself. So people don't have a sense that our Lord is present here. And, uh, and so we need, to, uh, we need to renew and again, resensitize ourselves to the fact that God is present in our midst. And he's present in a very specific way uh, in church, present to us in the tabernacle, present to us and the sacrament of the Eucharist. And so that becomes the central point. That becomes the central focus of everything that we do. And it's, it is the sacred that informs our evangelization. It's the sacred that informs our parish life. It's the sacred that informs peace and social justice. It is, it is what, sacred is what informs our spiritual and worship. When you and I have clarity about the presence of God in our life, then all of this begins to make sense. It's not just something that we do because we're Catholics. It's not just something that we do because, uh, because this is what we do. Or rather, we do these things in order, to, uh, in order to share our Lord, but also to experience our Lord. And that's what's really at, at the crux of the whole issue. When you and I able to enter into the presence of God, then all of these things really begin to make sense. So that's why over these last couple of days, you know, we talked about how we experience um, our Lord through spirituality and worship, through our liturgy and through the Mass, through our music, through our art and environment, through our liturgical ministers. All of this has to do with how we encounter our Lord. In the very same way, uh, through peace and social justice, we encounter our Lord. And remember that every human person is created in God's image and likeness. That we have the, the fundamental teaching of the uh, of, of Catholic so peace and social justice doctrine is that we have a fundamental option for the poor. And so for that reason, we have God's groceries, and we encounter our Lord as we feed the hungry, but as we feed the hungry, we also encounter our Lord. In the very same way, 
our outreach through Boxes of Joy that we just, um, that we are beginning to return. Where's it, Lane? Lane, where'd you go? How many, how many people returned to Boxes of Joy last weekend? Well, last weekend, uh, yeah. we have about 118 in there. About 118? So, uh, you know, through our mission support and through our legend offerings, then uh, we have the Tree of Hope. There is a rumor, this is a very, very nasty rumor, and I'm quelling it right now. There is a nasty rumor that I am eliminating the Tree of Hope. It is completely and totally false. I haven't even had a conversation about it. Susie and I, Susie Hartman and I, have been talking about the Tree of Hope. There is no conversation about eliminating it. We want to, uh, we want to offer um, assistance this Christmas to select families in the, in the Crown Point community, as well as the, um, the uh, Jabal home, uh, which also has a uh, campus um, in Sherville, so we want to offer our assistance there. And then also, um, we are rethinking our assistance program and, uh, and choosing to send um, financial resources to, uh, to programs that already have the structure to be able to provide help to those who are in need. So all of those different ways which we are the ways in which we encounter our Lord and which our Lord encounters us. In the very same way, when we talk about evangelization, it's, it's uh, when we know our Lord, when we experience our Lord, we offer that through outreach. We offer that through, um, uh, for our children, through youth ministry, through the school, through our faith formation program. In the very same way, we share the good news of Christ crucified, risen from the dead, from, through the rescue project, through uh, through the formed resource that's available to everybody in the parish, through City Summer Books, you're going you're to have an opportunity to receive an awesome book for your Advent preparation by Bishop Barron this year. It's just it's a really really lovely uh, and, and thoughtful journal that you'll be able to use uh, through small faith groups and uh, and us also through adult faith formation. And then finally, um, we encounter the sacred as we, um, as we bring children and adults into the faith through the RCIA and OCIC. And then also, we have parish life. Parish life is so key to what we are and who we are as a parish community. And we encounter our Lord in our community. When we gather for Mass, the, uh, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy says that that our Lord is present in four ways. He's present in the uh, in the Eucharist. He's present in the uh, in the Scriptures. He's present in the person of the priest, and he's present in the what the community. And so we have to realize, and when we encounter one another, that we are also encountering our Lord. And so for that reason, we offer hospitality. And we, uh, we have lots of communications. The St. Mary Bell, which, we, which Susie just started publishing last month, has, uh, had, has a myriad of different activities that you and I have the opportunity to enjoy every month. And it's all right here in this handy dandy, uh, in this handy dandy little book. And these will be coming out on a monthly basis because of the um, changes that we need to make as a result of, uh, of, uh, of the church closing, but, um, but we will still have and continue to have many, many different ways which to grow as a parish community. We also have organizations like the Altar and Rosary, the Knights of Columbus, and, that, and as you and the Moms group, all these different ways in which we grow as a parish community. And then also various events like well, we, the, weather, the weather caught us off guard, but um, you know, we had a trunk or treat that was, um, that was going to be offered, as well as some um, teal eating and, uh, and other opportunities. So there's lots and lots of different opportunities for us to grow as a parish community, but it's all grounded in an awareness of the presence of God in our midst. All right, anybody have questions, thoughts? Considerations, queries, concerns. No, speak now. Yes, my friend. Oh, you just offhand comment here about okay. the church closing. Are we talking about the roof repair thing, or are we're we gonna, talking about something bigger? We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Okay. Okay. All right. 
Okay, anybody else? All right. So let's talk about questions and answers. Now, just so that we're, um, so we can have some semblance of order. Uh, I want to lay out some ground, ground rules, all right? First of all, the person with the microphone, with the microphone gets to ask the question, all right? So Maura, you raise your hand. Maura will come by, she'll give you the microphone. And the reason why I should have the microphone is because I want everybody to hear your question, all right? So I don't want to have to interpret for you, but it would be helpful if you would just speak into the microphone. The second ground rule is please share questions and ideas and thoughts in a non-confrontational manner. Listen, I love you. I want to help you. Remember the very first day that I was in church here at St. Mary when I, uh, as a, when I was, as a, when I was became the pastor, I said, I want to walk with you on the way to heaven. I haven't changed in that position. I want to walk with you on the way to heaven. And so, please, we're all on the same side. We may not always see the same thing, we may not always see everything the same way, but we're all on the same team. Um, the other ground rule is please, please appreciate others and their opinions. And then finally, uh, respect your time, the time of others, in other words, you know, ask your question. I'll respond in the best way that I can, and uh, and then we'll just keep moving on. All right. And then I know that you will share what you hear tonight with people, and I want you to share information, but I want you to share it accurately. All right. Because there's lots of weird stuff going on there, and I hear it all the time. I said, I, I said, or the the church was on fire. Somebody called the parish office and said, Father, the church is on, or the, we heard that, the, uh, that there was a fire in church. So we're going to have mass. And I said, where did that come from? There's no, there's never been a fire in church. I was told that there was an infestation of termites in the church. And that's why we had to fix the roof. There's no infestation of termites. It's 130 years old. That's the reason. And, I, and you know as well as I do, you've heard it too. This is the, 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 uh, the roof issue is just a ploy for me to tear the church down and build something new. Completely false, completely false. So whatever you hear here, you have my permission to share away, but please share it accurately, okay? And then if you have additional questions, please, please, please contact me. In fact, if you open the front cover of your parish bulletin, I, we had share, God bless Cheryl Grandis, she has spent an extraordinary amount of time providing direct contact information for every person on the staff here and also ministry leaders right here in the bulletin. If you have a question, you can call me or you can call one of the uh, ministry heads or one of the staff members or you can send us an email, all right? But please ask questions. Do not assume anything, okay? And again, this is all part, it's all part of the fact that I wanna be transparent and I wanna communicate well with you. And I know there was some concern that this meeting was, some, was somehow secretive, uh, that the people were excluded. If you were at mass this weekend, I talked about it at every mass. It went out in the evangelist message five times this week. There was lots of opportunity. It was not quiet or secretive about this meeting. So I, I just, again, I, can, I want to communicate with you, but it's also the case, too, that we have to, uh, we have to be open to the communication. So, all right. Here you go, Laura, right here. Thank you. That's right. You get to stand up and face the camera. It's awesome. This is probably a stupid question. No, no questions are stupid. I haven't asked it yet. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Maybe you become St. Mary and not St. Mary's. So this is a really interesting question. So this is amazing. So St. Mary's is pretty much an abbreviation. Because, it, because ultimately, remember, it's, it's, a possessive, it's a possessive noun, right? St. Mary's, St. Mary's what? St. Mary's Parish, obviously, St. Mary's Church, but the, but they've done it, people are, are, over the over the generations. They've just kind of condensed it to St. Mary's. So that would be my response to that. If we 
was driving my sister crazy. <laughs> Is your sister an English major? No. Okay. Well. But she watches every Sunday on uh -huh. the computer, and it's like fingernails on the jolly board to her, and I don't right. know why. That's why in the communications that I that I publish, I always talk about St. Mary's Parish. Rarely will I ever say St. Mary's. So, but that's the reason. All right, we're gonna start off easy. That's an easy question. Anybody? You wanna ask your question about the roof? This is your big moment. Why is it backwards from the way it is in the church? Yeah. I don't go to the church and look at it. Okay, I will do that. But <laughs> I did not know that. Okay. And then the, if the rest of the question is, the, mm -hmm. is the, are we closing the church down for roof repair? Right. How long is that going to be? Sure. When does it start? Okay. What's it called? Sure. That's a good question. So I'm going to take each of these questions individually. All right. So. As I may have told you at Mass, in the roof of the church, there are four trusses, okay? Four triangles, if you will. And each of those triangles has a little square, all right? And the square supports the triangle and also bears weight. Now, there are four trusses. Three of them are in good condition, and one is starting to deteriorate, all right? Because it's 130 years old. I hope that I can hang on and have as much support as that church does after 130 years, but it's probably not gonna be the case. But 130 years uh, later, the, uh, one of those trusses has begun to, has begun to fail, all right? It's, it's not, there's no danger at all that the church is gonna fall in, all right? That the roof is gonna fall in. That's why I, when, I, when we were talking, when I was talking to the structural engineers, um, I said, so how much time do we have? And they said, you know, it's a great question. I said, so do we have to the 1st of January? Or should we, should we do it sooner rather than later? And they said, you know what, it would be better for you to vacate the building sooner rather than later so that we can begin to, to, uh, to repair what we need to repair. I said, okay, that's fine. So I chose... I chose November 19th as the last day that we would be in church because three weeks would give us, three, four weeks would give us um, a little bit of some time for transition, right? And then they're going to, after, they, after we vacate on the 19th, then on the 20th, the uh, engineers will come in and they'll begin to assess the building uh, in greater detail. They'll look at the floors, they'll look at the walls, and then begin to, uh, to determine what exactly needs to be, uh, what, what, what needs to be repaired, what needs to, obviously we know that one of the trusses needs to be repaired. But what we don't know is, how was the best way to repair that truss? Because you just can't take it out, because then you've got a bigger issue, all right? So that's the, uh, so that's the bottom line, is that there, there are repairs that are needed in church. The, the, uh, we haven't talked to any contractors yet, because uh, we want to continue to do our assessment of the building before we talk to a contractor. So there are two questions that are still hanging out there. And that is, how long will we be out of the building? And I'll be honest with you and tell you, no one's ever said this to me, but I plan for the worst and hope for the best. I really don't, I, I hope that we're, we're back in church by Easter time, but I don't know. I can't, I'm not, I, I can't commit to that. And I have no idea how much it's going to cost. Nobody's talking about it. So we'll have to deal with that as well. So I mean, we have we have savings. It's not you know it's not it's, it's not going to crush us. But at the same time, it's certainly something that we need to take care of. All right. Is that, is that an adequate answer for your question? So yeah, pretty much because it was part of it was are we going to have to rip into the ceiling? But we don't know that yet. No, we, we won't have, well, I mean, truth, truth be told, we actually have to replace the, the, uh, the, the roof tiles. We're going to, the slate is, is deteriorating as well, so we're going to need to replace the, the, roof, the roof tiles, uh, the ceiling tiles too. 
So there was the originally when we were talking with the elect or the uh, uh, the structural engineers, they they need to uh, for safety reasons they need to create two columns from the floor to the ceiling to uh, just to make sure that the ceiling is secure. I did not think that it was in everybody's best interest to be in church while they had those columns up because it's not going to engender a tremendous amount of confidence. So, uh, so that was part of the reason why we, uh, why we made the decision to come over. Okay? Okay. What else? Sheila. Um, so I wanted to address, I wanted to go back to the question about St. Mary's versus St. Mary. I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Father, isn't the official title of this church St. Mary? That's what it is on the website. Is it really? All right. There you go. There's the official diocese in response to that. So. Okay. Yes, Mary? Here comes more of the microphone. So, Father, um, during the week, if we attend Mass, um, mm -hmm. do we come in from the front entrance, come in on the side entrance, mm -hmm. or do we sign in at the office? Okay. What is the protocol? Good. These are good questions. So, <clears throat> in order for us to, uh, to make sure that the students are secure, for, in order for us to, uh, to uh, uh, fulfill diocesan protocols as well, and for us to continue to follow the, the safety protocols that we have in, in place, um, you, people who come into for, for mass during the week, will be able to will go through the office, but there will be, we, we're, we are investing in scanning technology, so you'll need to have your, um, you need to have your driver's license in order to, uh, to you, that will get scanned. And then information about you will be um, will be available, and then you're able to come in just to just into Amos Hall. So there'll be part of the room that will be set up. The rest of it will be set up for the students when they come in and watch. Um, so they're not going to come in from the right door. You're going to welcome them. So we yeah we, yeah you know what and we will we'll, we'll make that door. Uh, uh, open and available as well. But it, they have to come to the office, get scanned in, and then come into the right. office hall. Mm -hmm. So everybody that comes to church will be scanned. Right. Okay. Yeah. Come with you. Okay. Uh, is that the same process that's followed on Monday and Friday for the masses in the gym that we get? So up to up to this point, we haven't had the scanning technology, but there's been some there's been some concerns raised about that. So we um, so we contacted um, a company. Uh, called Raptor, so we're using Raptor technology to be able to provide that measure of security. Um, so the church will close on the 20th, so that means the mass will start what day of the school week? Well, mass would start, actually the, the, church would, uh, the church won't be available uh, after the 19th, so the, which is Sunday, so mass is then will begin on the 20th. So we're, we're working to make sure that the technology is available by the 20th. Will there be any other security measures like the officers or anything like that, or is it just the scan technology? I, I'm sorry? Will there be any officers or any security? Right, so we'll still have, we'll still have, there is a, um, there is an armed police officer who is um, attending and, and participates in mass on Monday and Friday, so he will still continue to be here. So he'll be here in the morning. A regular mass will be the Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday will just be the scanning and protocol coming into the mass. Correct, right. And the most part is trying to keep the parishioners confined to this mm -hmm. area and not in the yes, foyer. that's the plan. And it's also the case, too, that we're going to have mass at 8.15 rather than 7.45 uh, so, that, um, so that the people who are coming for mass at 7.45 they don't have to try to navigate the car line. I know the other parking issues. I tried to do that the other day. I actually got in the park, the car line. My, I have a tremendous amount of admiration for y'all. I don't know how you do it day after day. So, uh, so 
but we wanted to make sure that uh, that people were safe, that the mask doors were safe, that uh, and that every, every, the the the, uh, the order of the day is uh, is maintained for the good of the students. And then my last question: There's a bathroom in this place. I never really. There know. is, there is a bathroom. It's through the kitchen and to the left. I know, right? So, we'll have to have readers. We'll have to have readers show that. Yeah, Lindsay? Are they, how are you feeling? Hi. What's that? How are you feeling? I'm good. Good. Um, my question is, how are we monitoring who's coming to Mass, ensuring that they're parishioners and not just the public? So, as a parent of a student here and a parishioner, I kind of have, you know, sides on both that I see and concerns on both sides, but most importantly is I don't think we have anything in place to ensure that like anybody from the public or even, you know, the other parishioners from other churches in the area are welcome to our church, sure. right? So the biggest concern I have as a parent is not of our parishioners that we're all very comfortable with, but technically as I see it, anybody from the public really could show up that day. We don't have, or do you have something in place that ensures it's not the public coming into the school? The, the celebration of mass is a is a, is an in fact a public event, and uh, I haven't. We haven't been putting out. In fact, um, we were going to advertise. We were going to advertise. Um, we were going to advertise Christmas and Christmas masses, and we decided not a good idea. Uh, simply because we weren't sure who was going to come, and we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to deal with the overflow. In the very same way, you know, we haven't put out any kind of mass invitation for people to come to mass during the uh, during the week. Um, you know, Lindsay, I don't know that I would be able to, and quite frankly, I'd be reluctant if someone that I didn't recognize came into mass and said, "You have to leave." I mean, they have, they have a right to be here. So, I mean, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make, and we're gonna make, is we're gonna make all the efforts that we can to make sure that they do not enter any other part of the school, that they they not have any contact with any of the students. We have, um, we have vetted our buildings. We have used the resources that are available to us through the Crown Point school system. To, uh, to assess our security and safety measures. Um, we have a very, very long list. We have a safety committee. We have a very, very long list of different protocols that we use. Uh, you know, we're, again, we're using new scanning technology. We're doing the very, very best that we can to make sure that our students are safe and that, um, and that everything is, is secure. So I, I do see that you're trying to do the best you can, but I think that's the point, is that the difference between coming into Mass and coming into school, we have been ensured in several ways that from say 7 to 2.30, 7.30 to 2.30, our kids are secure in this building. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that Mass is a public event, mm -hmm. we've really been promoted that the parishioners, and even in our most recent newsletter, it said, a four or five elderly people will be coming to attend mass, you know, don't have concern. Mm -hmm. There just isn't, the reason we do have concern is because there's nothing, no measures in place to ensure that it's just those four or five people. Mm -hmm. And the public should be allowed mass. The public these days can't be allowed in the school. So as a parent, to volunteer at all or interact with my child, I have to have a recent background check and hours of virtuous background through the church, right, training. So, there's just this really great area that's happening with this where we too want you to, and you and I spoke personally, I want you to be able to share the word of God with anyone that wants it. Mm -hmm. This is why I have my child in this church and in this school. Sure. But unfortunately, the two worlds coming together are, for a lot of us parents, mm -hmm. are jeopardizing the safety measures that we do indeed have in place right now. And I just don't know how we're gonna marry it where our kids are still, as safe as they were between 7 and 2.30. For example, if we don't have that scanning technology, are you still going to allow mass on the 20th? And my heart would tell me, of course you want to. You can't just stop because you don't have the machine. But for us as parents, we've invested a lot of money and time and energy into knowing that they're as safe as they can be. The public schools have that 
carded and all that, now you can't even get into them. So I do venture to say we're slightly behind. I'm really glad we're trying, and I'm grateful for doing this. But I, I don't think it is really maintaining the safety or enhancing it for our kids. Okay. All right. The best I can do is continue to work on it. And that's kind of, and, and we, we are, and that's the bottom line. It's not, and, and you know, there's, a, there's an interesting word that you, you talked to, that you used, and that is the word interacting. Um, fundamentally, at 8.15 in the morning, there shouldn't be any kids in this area. It should be in a classroom. So, so my, so, and it's not, and again, the issue, the issue for me personally is that I am going to make every effort to ensure that your, your students, your children are safe. I don't want them to get hurt, for sure. And so I just want to, I just want to make sure about this. And then this is the other thing, and, and this is where, this is, bothers, is bothersome to me too, and that is that there's accusations that we are intentionally being or not communicating when things change. So if there is a last minute change because of some event that we're gonna go over to church, there's, the, there's an insinuation that somehow we're not being upfront and transparent. It's a last minute change. Uh, you know, maybe we need to be better prepared to, to communicate that. Sure. The, the problem that's happening with communication is parents get a wildcat newsletter, right. and we're very thoroughly informed. Then you have your bulletin for parishioners, right. and there's information that has been shared in the bulletin regarding things that affect when our children are in school. And then students only between, I'm only talking 7 to 2.30 when they're here, right? Um, then it's really important, it does seem like lack of transparency if it's not shared through the newsletter. I will say that the last two newsletters, Tom has gone above and beyond to clarify some things, sure. and I'm hoping that's part of our communication trying to continue, because I know you don't want anything to happen to the kids. All of us do, we all know, nobody does. Sure. But it's 2023, we've had over 500 mass shootings this year uh, in this country, and so all of us that have students in school, Nobody drops their child off anymore without saying a little prayer and being grateful for the safety for the staff and the students. So, you know, it's just, it's a concern. Thank you. Yeah, Brent.
our Lord Jesus Christ in a cafeteria. So my biggest goal is how do we keep that sacredness of our Lord and the altar where we have holy sacrifice of mass while we have children eat lunch. So if I I just have that's my biggest question. Oh so so your question is well, let me, let me answer your question this way. So, no, we are not going to keep a tabernacle here in this room during lunch hour. So, yeah. So we'll have to, what's going to ultimately happen is that we'll, uh, after the celebration of Mass, whatever, whatever consecrated bread is left is remaining, uh, we'll take to a secure location. So, yeah. The altar will be here. Um, because the altar is too big for us to transport back and forth, so um, so we'll we'll have to have that here. So, right, yeah, and we'll move that to a different location. Yeah, okay. Yes, Julie. Gonna, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Hold on. Hang on, Julie. I got you. Go ahead. I was just gonna piggyback off of uh, the one we heard in Till Jacket about uh, limited history of bad contracts. So you keep bringing up rapture, which is a good thing. I work in school. <laughs> Sure. We sort of use the same thing, um, but is that program just a name keeping line, or is that something that's run in a limited history background check before they're in a room with kids? And what's the procedure on a person leaving the building as well? Because if you're checking them in, what's the process of making sure that they've left the building as well? Sure, it's a fair question. So there is a limited there is a limited history, correct? Yeah, that's instantaneous. So that it's not just keeping names and addresses. Raptor check does a background check, and if it comes up, it's a safety check, and if it comes up with something that's questionable, a screen flashes up in front of our reception people, and texts go out to designated staff members saying, there's a questionable check, and this person should not enter, and then they will be addressed immediately. So it's super safe. It's excellent. And uh, and I think it's your, your question about exiting the building is legitimate too, for sure. So I think what we'll do is we'll have folks exit through that door, through the south door, and then they're just outside, and then they're good to go. Our biggest challenge, you know what the biggest challenge is going to be? Handicap parking. So we have to we have to figure out how we can make sure that we have appropriate numbers of, of handicap uh, handicap spaces for handicap parking. So. Our guests wearing name badges. What's that? Are the guests that are coming in from Raptor wearing name badges? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. So, want me to yell or do you? No, no. Yeah, I do. So his question was, well, let me let me let me make sure that I heard it correctly, because your question was, will the people who are come in, will they have name badges? Yeah, or some way to identify themselves. Some way to identify themselves. They have. They do use that now. There is a badge. So. Okay. So just like. Because you said you've used Raptor in your school system? Uh, not necessarily Raptor, but, oh, but something same that's similar. Yeah, so what it does is it scans their driver's license. It prints out a name badge for each person with a <coughs> picture on the badge, mm -hmm. as well as their identifying information and the places in the building where they are allowed to go. And so anybody walking around with one of those badges on, you can see their picture. It's got to match their face because it's from their official government ID. And it's got the time they came in, their legal name, where they're allowed to be. So it's tight. It's a great system. Just a follow-up question. So if it does come up as a red flag, your procedure is like... Oh, that's fine. If it does come up as a red flag, your procedures were to remove the person from the church service during school hours. Well, not, not from the church service. No. They're not here. They're not here. They're still out there. They're still you don't get through if they're still You're working through the visit.
something just came up on your license check, um, can you come on into the office and let's talk about it? And then, you know, it'll be handled appropriately. Okay? You know what, actually, Julie, did you have, did you get your oh, yeah. question addressed? Hold on a second. Okay, one second. Okay. Hold on here, all right? I have to follow up to do it. Sorry. Right. Don't, don't forget to talk loud, Julie. Father, you know, a while back, we had mass here at 6.20 in the morning. Uh-huh. Um, why can't we just have an early mass here when there are no children in the building? Mm -hmm. All right, I will take it under advisement. I'll take it under advisement. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say yes or no right now, but I'm gonna take it under advisement. Problem, you wouldn't have to have it, it. It solves some issues. It doesn't solve all the issues. So I, I appreciate. I, so I'll, I'll uh, for sure, I will give that some consideration. I have considered that too. All right. Okay, Mary, you have a question? No, 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 it's not for Sunday Mass. Just only only when the this the school's the school's in session. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Carolyn. So the short answer to the question is no. And it breaks my heart. But we we won't be able to have. There's a there's a lot of other uh, practical issues to consider, so we won't be able to have admiration. Sorry. Nor Monday morning. Nor Monday morning. Yeah. All right. Yes. Hey, wait. Hold on. One. One second. Oh, that's good. You're not getting you. You're not getting on the microphone. Sorry. One second. Ah. Uh, yeah. Cause come on. You got this. I know, uh, but our our friends on Facebook. No, you got to lose the microphone. In the bullet. Sure. Generation. We will do that. Thank you. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, I know there's doors for the elementary team mm -hmm. that closes off that sure. hallway. There are no doors for the middle school. That's there, correct. There's a gate, but there's no doors. Correct. Is there any consideration of doing that, especially since church has been in the gym? That has not been a consideration because it's a bigger structural issue. Yeah. But we can look into that possibility. I mean, the stuff that you're proposing is clearly, you know, it, it's valuable, but those kind of structural issues are not going to be able to happen by the 20th of November. I mean, we're going to do what we can, and we're going to be we're going to be as uh, as effective as we can to make to make sure that your that that the students are safe. So. Again, Lindsay, to go back to what you said earlier, you know, we're working toward an end. We want our kids to be safe, and we're, we're, and we're, working, as, we're working as hard and as fast as we can. Sure. And, and the fact of the matter is that I'm responsible for 540 students. I mean, it's on me too. So it's not as though it's just on you or Tom. Or the or the, the staff, it's on me as well. So I have a vested interest. In that. So. All right, yeah, Lowell. Hold Thank on, Barbara. We got you too. Go ahead. Well, just before uh, before it becomes an issue and people are just asking all kinds of questions, yeah. I'm here to confirm there is going to be Christmas music and Advent music, and we could use everybody here to help us sing it. <laughs> Thank you, Lowell. 
All right, Barbara, go ahead. You wanna, if Barbara has something to say. You know, I think so many people here are so worried about growth of people coming in here. Uh -huh. But I'm gonna tell you, I think a lot of people are gonna be attending other churches. Mm -hmm. I agree. I don't know about that. <coughs> My father, I've all brought up music. So um, I've been teaching here for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I used to minister for like 18 years. I know teenagers. Sure. I, th I think I do. And I think I know what warms their heart and gets them excited about their faith. I'm concerned about the new music series. Okay. Um, I play my guitar on Sundays too. Um, I just, I'm, I'm just concerned that. Uh, um, I know what kind of music speaks to the kids, and I, I think drums speak to the kids, I think contemporary stuff speaks to the kids, and you know, I, I try to get them excited about their faith every day in religion class, they're, they're, some of them are kind of on the fence about confirmation, and I just, I just, um, I understand that we're trying to return the sacred, but I also feel like sacred means different things to different people. Sure. And for the teenagers who I'm advocating for right now, for the, for the eighth graders, for the, for the confirmanding, I just hope we're open to that kind of music that speaks to them, because what speaks to me, what doesn't speak to you, and I, I just, I'm just hoping that we have an open mind to the young people, because you know it's so cliche that the future of the church, but they really are, and you know we're gonna, if we bore into tears with, I mean, no offense, Gregorian chants that that's not gonna speak to their heart, then they're gonna go to Bethel Baptist, you know, and they're not gonna come back here, and I, I don't wanna lose them. We need them. I'm sorry. Oh, it's ready for you, Pat. Don't worry, you don't have to do anything to it. I, um, I was interested in what you were saying about the music. Uh -huh. I was, when I heard about the music, I started, when I saw the video uh -huh. was presented, I was excited about it. I mm -hmm. thought it sounded beautiful. I think, um, I think that people are looking structure and more 
announced that there is a chapel in the Redford Parish office, correct? No. Oh, not anymore? Oh, sorry. <laughs> So here, I will, I will tell you about this. So again, just in the spirit of transparency. Oh, I'm sorry. So we have the, I, I asked permission from Bishop McClory to uh, to reserve the Blessed Sacrament in the uh, in the parish office. And he was very specific to say, uh, is it is it to be reserved for the for the public? Uh, and uh, and I said no, that we would uh, that we would reserve it for the folks who are in the office, and so he was peaceful with that. The truth of the matter is that that space is pretty small, so it would not have a lot of opportunity for public adoration. So, so that's what that was, that's what that reference was. It's all right, no worries. So, Lauren, you got something? They didn't before, but they do now. <laughs> um, so the last town hall that we had, earlier this year, there was a lot of talk about the school and all the updates it needed. Sure. With the church repairs now mm -hmm. looming, where does that put everything for the school and for the St. Agnes Center? And I know that that's... We just had an extension committee meeting on Tuesday. Yeah, so that's Tuesday. So, you know, it, it may it may delay it a little bit, but I don't anticipate that it would it would be a significant like years delay. So so we're still we're still on task. We're still moving in a direction. So yeah, we're good. Yeah. Yeah, Amy? Oh you do because because you're on Facebook. Yeah, this feeds into oh, the Oh you'll see the videos we are talking ahead. Where will confession be? Okay, this is a great thing. So this goes back to Julie's comment or question about why can't we have mass at uh, at six fifteen? Because if we're going to continue to have confessions in the morning, my thought was that we would have confessions from six thirty until seven, and then we'd have mass here at eight fifteen. Now, I'm willing to willing to look at that differently. The uh, and it was actually going to confessions. We were going to hear confessions in the uh, in the former uh, secretary's office for faith formation. So easy in, easy out. Okay. So that's that was the thought behind that. So uh, on Saturdays, are you talking about on Saturdays? What are you What are you, What are you going to tell your kids about first reconciliation? Sure, sure. So, so some things have not been solidified yet, but you've got nothing to worry about. We're going to take care of that. We're going to take care of that. Uh, so, uh, like in here uh, and on the weekends, we'll have we'll have um, we'll have portable confessionals that are that are set up for for use um, during the week. Um, you know, we'll 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 clarify that. Okay. I have a comment, and okay, basically it was after Brad mentioned about the kind of music we need for kids. I've been singing since I was seven years old, thanks to my mother in a choir that was in a parish in Gary, and I continued singing in a choir. I don't feel that we have to have music that resembles more of a modern tone. Let's just say, like many mega churches have, have, I grew up thinking, you know, this is church, and I was a small child and became accustomed to sacred music. And I believe in my heart that um, others can do as well. I mean, I, I'm not of an old, old generation. I think, I think of it more as if I grew up next to my mother singing in a church choir. And that became the kind of music where we honor God, um, then other generations can follow. It seems more of a modern concept. 
that now that there's rock concerts and different um, types of music more in that vein, and I'm not saying our church has rock music, that's not what I'm saying. church um, is a draw for people because we are more sacred with our faith than a lot of other modern Christian churches. That's my opinion. And um, I've gotten used to see being contemporary as well as sacred. So um, that's where I'm going to leave it. Go ahead, Nick. By the way, we're at 7 o'clock. If anyone feels compelled that they need to go, then please feel free. There's no, uh, there's no, and I just, again, I want to also, uh, there's, I know there's a lot of energy behind the question of music. And I also want to just remember that we need to appreciate others and appreciate their opinions. So, go ahead, Nick. That's okay. I just wanted to share a thought as a musician, not only here, but I also fill in at the, the diocese level for, for piano, so I fill in when people are out for vacation or you know, sick leave or whatever they, they need coverage for. So, so I see a lot of mainly Catholic churches, but I've also played when people need it for our Protestant you know, brothers and sisters. And I can tell you for sure, Mary, that in the pews, in the, they don't call pews over there? Um, there is a direct correlation between the traditional music and the attendance that I've noted. Embrace the moment see what happens, and evaluate it. I think that there's value in, uh, in, in that kind of exploration. So, yeah, that's, I guess that would be my, my big thought about that. So, Pat, I know you get the microphone again. Okay, I know a lot's been said about the music. Sure. But we go to church not to be entertained, but to provide a sacrifice. Give it, we bring our sacrifice to the Lord's sacrifice. If we want to keep entertaining people, then we're going to have to increase the amount of entertainment every time. I have gone to different masses where everybody is up there dancing, clapping, and this is that mass. I expected the Blues Brothers to be doing carpet this is, we are Catholic. We are not, I, you know, other traditions have other traditions, but we are there for a sacred purpose, not to entertain. Okay, thank you. Brett, do you want to say something? Am I allowed to say anything even though I work here? Sure. <laughs> And then you can hand the you can then you can hand the microphone to Brad. Um, so just the other day, I was on the phone. My son's 19. He's a seminarian, and he was telling me about the stuff that's going on in seminary. And he tells me a lot about the the environment that these guys have come from, and to a fault, they're from a, a more sacred background, and it's what they love. So these young guys coming up, they are. Music that happens in liturgy, and music that happens in praise and worship services, which are beautiful and fun for kids, bonfires, all that kind of cool stuff that we can do with them where that more contemporary music would be applicable. Sure. But in the worship of our Lord, there, can, there is a great, uh, there's a great deal of power in delineating those two things. Our mass is a totally different thing from like a praise and worship service. And so it's directing hearts and minds to the real presence there. And so I am seeing you know, really young guys love this. I think there's a big difference between the way things ought to be and the way things are. And that would be great if the kids, if that music, and I understand Leo, you know, that speaks to him, but, but I'm talking like kind of middle of the road team that I deal with every day who, a priester who doesn't come to church every Sunday, let's be honest, there's a lot of them, they're not here at this meeting, are they? Um, and those are the kids we're talking about, okay? And as a teacher, you gotta reach them before you can teach them. 
right? You gotta get them in the building. You gotta get them in the building. And I'm not saying it's gonna be a rock concert. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying you gotta play music that speaks to their soul. It, they're not gonna show up. We're gonna lose them to Bethel. It's not selling out your faith. It's just you have to reinvent what you think it means to be a faithful person. I, I think there's this 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 this, this sense that like if we don't do it the way we did when we were kids, it's wrong. And I think that's so backwards thinking. I can't teach these kids in 2023 the way your teachers taught you and whatever that year was. We have to move forward or we're moving back. That's where they're at, and that's how we're going to speak to them. It doesn't work for you, but it works for them. And we're losing them. We're losing them. I do this all the I do this 40 hours a week. We're losing them. I'm not asking for a rock concert. I'm not saying, you know, bring in Taylor Swift to sing hymns. I'm just saying make it something that they, that that makes their makes their toe tap a little bit. You know what? Nothing warms my heart more. Then we do a school, Nick and I do a school mass, and then we, we finish the song with a little bit of up-tempo, right? Those kids are singing that song all morning. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. They're not, when we're, when we're playing something that's, that's, that's um, I don't know, leading the Lord, they love that song, they, they, they're singing that song all morning long. When there's, that's a good thing, okay? So if that doesn't speak to you, that's fine, but they're not here. They're not here, Luke, Luke is in this room. None of the kids are here except for this little guy, right? So I'm advocating for the kids. I know what speaks to them, and I just think we need to think outside the box that we want these kids to be excited for their faith. I don't think it's selling out. I think it's progressive, and I think it's what these kids need, or we're going to lose them. I've been saying this for so long, and I just, I just worry. I just really worry that music is the one thing that I think gets them excited. You know, let's be honest. When you were a kid, was mass boring for you when you were a kid sometimes? Come on, you can say that in front of the Father. He's not going to judge you. Was Max a little boring when you were a kid? Come on, it was. Okay, well, well, it was for me a lot of times when I was born. I'm sorry. Bad Catholic, okay? We may disagree, but I, I know kids. I know kids. I know it speaks to them. And I, you know what? We're going to move on. <laughs> Michael, do you have a question? Do you have a, do you have a statement? Go ahead. All right. So we're not going to solve this tonight, okay? And it's it's a common problem. It's resistance to change, okay? So all we need to do, we try. If it doesn't work, you know, voices have been heard, but you know, we need to have our faith. Uh, I mean, he's going to lead us today, or he's going to lead us sure. where we need to go. So he's not doing something that's going to lead us the wrong way. So let's just adopt it, see how it goes.
I think otherwise we would be withering and die. Um, so I, there was the, the question I have: Is there any move to go backwards on the female ultra servers occurring here? I heard some chat that there's going to be a change in that. Is that any truth to that at all? So there will be some changes with the altar servers, but it's not a matter of eliminating them, no. So that's what you're asking. Yeah. I wasn't sure what was sure. Oh, sure. Sure. No. no, so at the end of the day, and this is this is the Cliff Notes version. Um, what we want to do is uh, so there's some there's some statistics that are important to understand. We have 95 servers here at St. Mary, which is, which is awesome, right? Uh, 67 of them are female, and, uh, and then the remainder are, um, are males. Uh, what we want to do is we want to give the, uh, we want to give the boys a sense, or a, an opportunity to serve more. Uh, and so we're going to, we're just going to cluster them. We'll do the same thing with the ladies, cluster them. So they're serving together, uh, which will then uh, give them an opportunity to serve more frequently, and the boys will have a chance to serve more frequently. But they will not be eliminated from serving now. So that's the that's the bottom line. So, yeah, Julia. So. I like to just share one thing. I've lived in this diocese my entire life. I've been a member um, at St. Mary's in Griffith, St. Um, Joan of Arc, St. Michael's, and now here. Um, one thing I have learned that's critical when I graduated from eighth grade. For a lot of my classmates, that was their last formal year in a Catholic school. And we were in it close knit because we survived some pretty tough nuts, so we felt united. But we felt after we left Catholic school, something was missing in our life. And this was coming from the guys, more from the guys than the girls. And we had a priest that came, Father, oh, Father, Father Tim Benante. Tim Benante, yeah. Yes, he mm -hmm. was there at the parish when I was sure. a teenager. And he encouraged us to have a youth group. So I would, I don't know if you have one here, we're relatively new here. But that group got so many boys involved and we did go where they wanted to go. I can't tell you how many hockey games I had to go to. We would get a bus, I didn't know anything about hockey, I still really don't except when they win bid. Um, but we went there and we would have, we would have games come and play at the, at the school at the time, and the public school kids came. These were people who never went, who heard all our horror stories from being in Catholic school, but they still came and we were still together. Now I think at least three or four priests came from my parish. Father Kine, Father Yadrin, um, there was a, another one that came from our parish, there was like three of them. Mm -hmm. and, and they're like, oh we had youth group, we had a desire for Jesus, and after Confirmation in eighth grade wasn't there. So if you have want to reach out to the youth, that's where to get them. You get them to come to your youth group. You get them to where they are. And they will eventually, I will tell you a sad story quickly. One of these girls from the public school came. All she could do was sit and be by herself, but she came because she wanted to be where the band was. She ended up murdering somebody. And I inquired about her because I knew her and remembered her from being at youth group was able to communicate with her while she was in prison. She is now a Catholic, and she has returned all because of a youth group back in the 70s that played the kind of music she wanted to hear in the, in the school, not in the church. And I just think there is, you're right. I mean, I'm a Hebrew Collins fan and, and others, and I've been to diocesan and events where they've brought in great fans for their youth, but that's where your music is really important there. But I have to agree with Satan All right, so, okay. Father, we all know that every week, kids, week after week, used to pass out with church. I know it's because they say their coats, you know, they don't take their coats off, mm -hmm. they don't eat breakfast, they get too hot. But as long as the construction is going on, can they take a look at the air circulation and see if it can be improved? Yeah. That was the ceiling fans or other things? Yeah, that was a conversation about that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, 
I'm just going to ask you to do one more thing for me. And that is that, so again, I have been more than transparent today. I got nothing to hide. You had opportunities which you came to ask, and I've given you honest answers. I would just ask you to help me do one thing, and that is to quell, in fact, crush the rumor mill. Because the rumor mill, everybody loves St. Mary, and I know that you love St. Mary, and I know why you love St. Mary. It's a great place. But the one thing that's going to crush this parish is the rumor mill. And so if you hear stuff that didn't come directly from me, then please tell whoever you're speaking to to contact me. I'd be happy to talk to them. But it's not fair that things being said are, that are completely untrue are being circulated. And for example, we're going to, that I'm going to, I'm going to eliminate the tree of hope. It's completely unfair. And I think that those kinds of rumors are destructive and that will ultimately harm the parish. You may not always agree with me and I get that, but at the same time, again, I love you. You may not want to hear it, but I do. I love you. And I want to walk with you. But I want you to walk with me too. Because we're all in this together. We're not going to get to heaven by ourselves. So I'm just going to ask that you would help me do that. Thank you, Steve. All right. So, you ready? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to end the night. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Brian, thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate it. So this whole conversation is going to be on the, uh, on the website and also on the Facebook page. If you want to review anything, I'm very, very grateful that you came to.